Jesus came to earth and he inspired people to follow him to the point that they would go to their death for him. Now I dare say that there are men and women in this room that would not die for Christ. I hate to say that, but truth is truth. If it came right down to it in America, where we were literally to put to the death or to say we deny Christ, which would we do? Are we inspired enough of our Savior that we would say, I'll die for Him? I wonder about those things because here's what Jesus told His disciples. Go make disciples of me. And then he says this cool part. He says, and signs will follow. He didn't say go do miracles and then they'll believe you. He said, you go get them as disciples first, then signs will follow. Isn't it amazing? They followed Jesus because of the miracles. No. They followed Jesus before he ever turned water into wine in Canaan. They were inspired to follow him. I wonder today in the church how many people we are inspiring to follow Christ. Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It absolutely is. How many are we inspiring to seek the work of the Holy Spirit? How many are we inspiring to live like heathen because outside the walls of the church we live like heathen? How many people has God placed in your path this week that are hungry for God. Because let me make this clear. You can argue if you like. But there are more people that are not in church because they've been hurt by someone or something in the church than there are people that just don't go to church. I talked with a man yesterday standing in the parking lot who got hurt legitimately. Now I know that if the preacher's preaching about sin and it's your sin and you leave and you say, well, the church hurt me, that's a lie, and you know that because that was God's word speaking to you. But this man got legitimately hurt by the church. And he hasn't been back since. What are we doing as the body of Christ to inspire a world to be what we have in us? Let me read you some scripture. I won't even ask you to stand today. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. Last week we talked about raising a standard. Let me throw this at you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when they came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am very well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God, spake as they were inspired or moved by the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you something. How many believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Can I get a hand raised? Why don't you put your hands down? When's the last time you shared your testimony with somebody? Don't answer that. But when's the last time? Here's what Peter wrote in 2 Peter. Here's what he wrote to them. By the eyewitness of what we saw. You said, well, he saw Jesus. I did too on my own personal road to Damascus. When he said an alcoholic that instantly sober. If Peter understood that to inspire a lost and dying world to know this Savior, you're going to have to share not fables, not stories. You're going to have to share what you've seen God do with your very own eyes. How many times have you been here long at all and you heard me talk about having cancer shrink in my hand? You know why I share that? You know why I promote people sharing their testimony? Because the world is dying and going to hell and the church is sitting in the pews going, glory to God, glory to God. But we're not, in, we're not causing anyone out there to want what we got. 
we don't share Christ. Peter writes it like this. He says, I'm not giving you fables and I didn't believe a fable. I was inspired by what I saw. And I share it with you. See, I can't tell you every Bible story. I can't answer every question. But I can tell you what he did to me 25 years ago. I can tell you and you can't take it away from me. You can't deny me of what he did for me. You can't steal. And I, yesterday, see some folk, and I know this isn't about this, but some folks don't want to do anything but show up to church, sit in the pew, and then that's all they want to do. They won't do anything else for the church whatsoever. Wayne Bell, myself, Wendy, and a few others put about 22 hours in out here yesterday in the, in the last two days in the sun. I sold over $1,000 worth of my stuff. God is good. A lot of that was one big item. But do you know what my highlight was? Sitting and weeping with veterans one-on-one, -on -one, welcoming them, welcoming them home. Sharing Jesus one-on-one -on -one with people when they begin to pour out their heart about how they've been damaged and destroyed. And I see the church world, it's almost like that, and I'm not you guys, I know this is churches down the road, not us, but it's almost like we smell blood in the water. <coughs> Do you hear what so-and-so did? We can crucify someone faster than the, than the disciples were killed. Jesus said, come follow me. And they followed. And he inspired them so much that they were willing to die for it. And if we're not careful, we will end up so self-centered that everything he did is all about me and nothing about him. And he said, now I'm going to go make a nice place for you. Will you inspire them to be drawn to me? Will you do something that makes you a Jesus owner for life? Will you do something? Because i got to be honest, guys. I see more drama from church folks on social media than I do Christianity. And it breaks my heart. Because if what we're promoting... Come here a second. I know. You weren't here for a service. Now you're sick on Grew up in Oklahoma. You ever seen those churches where uh, people walk in the door and they go... Oh, honey, come back here with me. You're not wearing church clothes. We got church clothes in the back. <laughs> See, you may not have seen that, but I've been there. When we were more concerned about what they put on than we were about their immortal soul. We were more concerned. You know you've seen it. Had to. And women, oh, God, she wore pants. <laughs> Some of you church ladies, go back and get her a dress out of the back and help her get dressed in church clothes. <laughs> so why don't we just embarrass her to the point that she walks out the door, split tail wide open, because we're more concerned about what she's wearing than we are about whether she makes it or not. Pastor, I've got an idea. You know, those homeless people have been coming. They don't smell so good. So let's rope off an area in the back corner back there with camel. And let's rope <laughs> off a corner and let's put them in there. That way they can come to church and they can smell like their own kind. Pastor, I know you will agree with me, right? Church, I make this graphic, but here's reality. If we're not sharing Christ with the lost and dying world, you mash your finger and they hear you cuss more than the next sailor down the road, and they think they're okay with you. Now, I'm going to ruffle some feathers here, but it doesn't bother me one little bit. I'm going to ruffle some feathers. When you're sitting at the, at the restaurant and you're drinking a nice cold beer, 
and you think there ain't nothing wrong with it, one beer between you and God is between you and God. But if the man you've been witnessing to sees it and he justifies his alcoholism by the way you're living your life and he thinks he's just as good as you are and he never finds the Christ you've got because you wouldn't accept one meal without a certain uh, amenity. I know. I've been mean for two weeks in a row, haven't I? But here's what I know. I probably talked to 70 people that knew Rod. And I can't find anybody that would say a negative word about that man. No matter where you went or what you did, he loved you. Jim Nelson said, boy, I need some tires for my truck. Rod said, let me go to the house. He brought him back a set of tires. My daughter said she was like this high. She said, I love that mini bike. He said, you go home and you write up a contract between me and you. You put on there, Rod Erickson sold this for one penny to Rebecca Woody. And he had, she had to sign it. He had to sign it. She had to give him a penny. Before he died Monday morning, Friday, he sent me one said, I love you, man. I miss you and I love you. He never met him, but he didn't give you a hug. Where is the love in the body of Christ? Where is the love when we have gotten so fixated on legalism or on our theology of what it said? What does it matter if they believe pre-trip and you believe post-trip? What matters is the condition of their soul. Peter writes, <coughs> share what God has done for you. He said, we come, you sit down, I'll pick on you all day. He writes, we have not followed cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses. I watched the cancer sink shrink. I saw it. I felt it with my hand. You can't tell me any different. And I'm going to share it with everybody I can. inspires the world to have what we got. Because if what we got ain't worth inspiring them, we might need to give a little more ourselves. I know that's hard. But let me tell you something. You call me and tell me I'm damned because of the mistakes I made, I'm probably not coming your way. I get plenty of that already. I don't need any more. If all I can do is condemn the world, how will they ever know to be inspired by this God that I serve? Amen. How will they ever know? You know what started the conversation yesterday? I was moving a box in a ratty t-shirt and it rose up like this right here. I sure did. And he come over and said, what clock you got, son? I said, well, 43, 9 mil. He said, I'm carrying a 10. I said, oh, look, Bigfoot over there's got a 10 mil there, too. He, we, the next thing you know, we're talking about Jesus because we were talking about God. Amen. Amen. It doesn't take much to share your Jesus. What takes much is to have the courage to do it, right? It does. It takes a lot for us to do that. But let me ask you something. Don't raise your hands. Don't answer. Just think. How many of us have been alcoholics and now we have children that are alcoholics? Or drinkers? How many of us have been bad with our finances and our kids couldn't pay a penny for a sucker? But under the same token, how many have inspired your children because you're great with finances for them to be good with their finances? Every day of our life, we're inspiring somebody to do something good or bad. And 
And he says you've got an interpretation of the prophecies. You've got everything you need right here to present the world. That is dying and fleeing hell wide open. You call the preacher and say, Can you lead my neighbor to the Lord? You know what the preacher ought to say, Dave? If you ain't got enough Jesus in you to lead him to the Lord, then I should probably come and pray for you first. My job isn't to. To save everyone. I couldn't if I tried. I can't save anybody. I'm not dying for anybody. I hope. My job is to inspire you to go do the work of the Lord. Your job is to do the work of the Lord. Your job is to not sit at home and make this your service to God on Sunday morning, every other month, right? Once a month. I'm going to serve my Lord. Love Him with all my heart. Really? Who have you shared it with? Because church, if we don't raise our standards of inspiring others about this Jesus, see, I want to get there. Can we just be real today? Oh, look. My watch fell off. Amen. So I didn't lie to you. It fell off. My dad inspired me to hunt. And I love it. I wish I could do it as good as the Matthews guy. Can. Yeah. But I can be in the woods. Because he taught me. He inspired me. One of the greatest pleasures I've known in ministry ever. Ever. And I've led hundreds of people to Jesus greatest things I've ever felt in ministry. So that boy right back there said, I'll wait to you. Because everything in me says this. Oh, oh, people are going to say stuff. People are going to talk. Oh, oh, he did. He, he set this up where his son could be. When I have to tell him to hush every night when he's talking about Jesus and sharing and when he's going to share now because I'm trying to watch my TV show. <laughs> To know that he is excited about serving God. That somewhere along the way he got inspired by something. Who have you inspired in your life that is on fire for God? Don't answer. Christ sent us, left us here to reach a lost and dying world. What are you doing to make that happen? What are you doing? Well, I'm preaching. Let me tell you something. If this is all I'm doing, I'm not doing much. Because every day I encounter people. The man that I mentioned to you that I won't mention his name, that I talked with for almost an hour yesterday, came back by yesterday afternoon and he said, you know, we talked about so many things, can I show you this gun? Made a special trip over here. Been hurt by the church. Didn't know pastors actually cared about things. amazing woman of God. She bought pen and pencil sets. Custom made in a little gun case. Gorgeous. She gave $50 a set for them. Donate them to the church so we can make money on them. The vet's standing at our table, a different person the other day. 
or any Vietnam vet hat. I said, welcome home. In a few minutes, we talked for a little bit, and I said, can I give you a gift? And I walked over to the table, and I opened up the box, and I said, this isn't much, but it's handmade. It's got a little rifle on it. It's made out of a bullet. This end of it, it, it solid oak. I want you to have this. And big tears began to run down his face. And he began to tremble all over. And he grabbed me and he bare hugged me. And when he got his composure, here's what he said. Since I've been back, I've got two gifts. Two. One was a participation award that everybody that went to Nam got. Every person. And the other is over 20 years later, standing in a church parking lot, a man gives me a set of pins. He said, I can't even get my insurance. Now, I know some of you that are vets have got your insurance. If you were in country America serving, you probably had a better chance of getting it than if you were in Vietnam. If they have a reason and an excuse not to give those guys anything. We stood and hugged and cried and pray over these men. It does not take much to share your faith. It takes a lot more control than I have. So the real question, I guess, is who are you inspiring? And what are you inspiring them to do? Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm inspiring them to hate my neighbor. <coughs> I want them to hate the Democrats. I want them to hate the Republicans. Man, I don't like those cats either, but let me tell you something. If 50% of America is Democrat and 50% is Republican, am I going to shut 50% off and damn them to hell and not give them a shot? Gun hunters, they're useless. Tracing through the woods, shooting 400 yards. Of, they need Jesus. They need not both, right? The point is this, and I make a, a smile at it. Church, if we're ever going to raise our standards like we talked about last week, we need to raise our standards of presenting Christ to a lost and dying world so they won't want you gone. Because if they see you say it on Sunday and live it different through the week, they're not going to want what you got.
says we are to imitate Christ. Let me give you a few things that he did. He went by a little short man in a tree that nobody liked because this cat had stole money from all of them. That's why I keep my hands in my pockets guarding my $2. <laughs> and my pocket knife. Jesus said, you're a thief, you're a liar, you're a thug, you're useless, and if you don't get right, you're going to hell. Right? Isn't that what he said to Zacchaeus? No. He said, can I come over and drink some tea at your house? And the religious crowd said, oh. And because Jesus inspired the man, he began to give back everything he had stolen. Can you imagine being the one caught in adultery and hearing the words, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What about the woman at the well? She was so inspired before he even solved her problem. She went back to town to tell everybody, come see the man. He didn't condemn her, he loved her. Everything in the world says that Christians hate. It's a fact. Turn on your news. If I say homosexuality is a sin, I'm a hater. And I don't hate. So maybe I just need to, rather than try to fight with them, I just need to love them right where they're at. And let them see this beautiful and amazing God I have living inside of me. Maybe it's time the church gets back to imitating Christ Jesus rather than worrying about our agenda for what we want to do for Christ. Well, he turned over tables for the religious crowd, not for a lost and dying world. See? There was somebody flashed the light. I could kill them for that. <laughs> I love Miss Clay. She came and donated a bunch of stuff yesterday. Stayed out in the sun with us. Ask yourself this question today. Look back through the last couple of years of your life. Who have you inspired? And what have you inspired them to do? Because I'm going to be honest with you. And I'll probably ruffle some feathers. There's enough churches of 20 people screaming hellfire and brimstone every week. I believe in hellfire and brimstone, but if the only 20 you got agreeing with you and then no one else is coming in and no one's getting saved and no one's growing and no one's getting delivered, but you 20 are on fire for God, you need to wake up and realize that bashing people will not deliver them. You're not going to win them over. You might win them over if you love them. Inspired by the Holy Spirit to just love people. Isn't it crazy out of 66 books? Stay with me so I'll shut up. <laughs> out of 66 books of the Bible that are inspired by the Holy Ghost, then he throws this in there a couple of times. He throws this in there a couple of times. Can I give you the Woodyism version? Love God, love people, everything else will work out. Love God, love people, everything else will work itself out. You mean I, I love God, love people. Pastor, I've heard about love. Well, then start trying to apply it to your life. How can we get to the deeper things of God if we can't even determine what love is? I'd like to think that if they were going to put you to death for your faith and I could save you, that I could give my life for you. Because that's what love is. Father, as we open up this altar, I pray that any hindering spirit be bound right now. That you touch and that you touch your people. Love them unconditionally.
whatever their need is. Altars open, whatever your needs are, from salvation to healing. 